Hello, everybody, and welcome back to uh, Buckeye Politics. It's me, your favorite Ohioan. All right, so we're going to do a Senate prediction today. I normally do these at the beginning of every month, but uh, I, like, kind of was sick the beginning of the month, and I had finals the beginning of the month, and so, like, I couldn't do them. And then it was, like, June 8th or 9th, and I was like, I'm not going to do it now because it's, like, not past. It's, like, too far after the beginning of the month. But then it's been, like, another week or two, and I was like, you know what? Uh, let's just do a Senate prediction now. It, who cares about when it comes out as long as we get one out this month? And I really didn't want to wait till the end of the month. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's, just, let's just start doing the Senate prediction now. So I think the Republican Party is it's pretty much the same map as last time. I think the Republican Party is still going to get at least 54 seats. Um, prob at least 53, probably 54. I'm going to fill in all the safe Republican states now. Um, that's, this is a, These are all the safe Republican states. These are all the states that the Republican Party will win uh, by more than 10 percentage points in. All these should be pretty self-explanatory. Instead of Iowa, um, Chuck Grassley has been in the U.S. Senate for like 40 or 50 years. He's like upper 80s, and he's absolutely beloved in that state. And the main Democratic challenger who actually had a chance, she was she was the person who actually running a campaign, and like actually the, the front runner at least, to probably lose, to make the race at least maybe a little bit competitive. She'd still lose by a safe march. She'd still get destroyed, probably lose by like 20 points or so. But she actually lost the primary to this no-name guy who has not campaigned at all. So Chuck Grassley's chances just increased. And then the state of Florida, Marco Rubio is the incumbent senator there. He won by eight points back in uh, 2016. And since then, Florida has shifted heavily to the right. Uh, with DeSantis on the ballot, I think that's going to help him quite a bit. It's a red wave year as well. Rubio is very popular in Florida and with uh, you know the national environment. I see no reason he doesn't win by a safe margin. Um, he only have to do two points better. And in a huge national environment that should favor him, it's probably going gonna, gonna to happen. Um, the safe Democrat states include the states of Oregon, California, Hawaii, uh, Illinois, Maryland, because Larry Hogan, the incumbent Republican governor there, did not run. If he did run, it'd pro that would actually be pretty interesting. New York, Connecticut, Vermont. Vermont could be interesting. The incumbent Democrat is actually retired. And the Republican running, she is a very interesting Republican. She's like a, she's a lesbian lawyer who's like... Libertar very libertarian, but she's like she's a young lesbian lawyer, and she's running as a Republican in Vermont. So that race could be interesting. It, it, she could, you know, possibly tap into that Phil Scott um, liberal like crossover. You know, if she runs against an old white guy, you know, Vermont they're very, very uh, social justice oriented up there, despite the state being like 99% white. So you know that could, she could possibly make make it interesting up there. I don't think she is. And even if she does win, and I, it doesn't really matter. She's she's a right. She's literally a Republican in name only. She would have voted to confirm Katanji Brown Jackson the Supreme Court. She's basically a liberal on every issue. She, I think she voted for. Biden over Trump in 2020. So even if, if she did win, it'd be like, woohoo, the, the Vermont has a Republican senator who's going to vote with us. Never. Who's basically a Democrat. So it does not really a point there. If she, if she wins, great. If she loses, I don't really care. Now, the likely states for the Republican Party include states of Ohio, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and that's going to be it. The state of Wisconsin incumbent Senator Ron Johnson won back in 2016 by about three points or so. He is actually he's very popular up there still. Going to be a Republican way of year. Wisconsin has taken a heavy shift to the GOP in recent years, with white working class voters becoming more Republican. Rural Democrats who lived in like the Driftless area near the Minnesota border who voted Democrat for a long time because you know they're union voters. They're uh, socially conservative and fiscally very liberal. I shouldn't say very liberal. They're they're relatively socially they're they're populist on economics. They're slightly left-leaning in economics, but they're socially conservative. The longest time it was the Democrats. Trump came in, completely flipped the switch. A lot of these voters, you know, swing voters, are actually favored the GOP. Ron Johnson actually did decently with those voters already. He'll make ing he'll do he'll continue to do well in the in the uh, Wow counties, the suburbs of Milwaukee, and he'll just keep doing better with blue-collar voters. And I think he should have no problem winning by six or seven points, considering the fact that he's going up probably going to be going up against Mandela Barnes, who is literally a far who's a far left um, African American dude who blames white people for all his problems, and that's not going to go well in a state like Wisconsin. The state of Ohio, I, I was going to put safe, but Tim Ryan is actually running a very solid campaign against J.D. Vance. I didn't expect him to go full-on blue dog Democrat on us. I think Vance should still win by eight, nine points, but it's not. It's probably not going to be safe. Just because Tim Ryan is actually running a very good campaign. He's, he's he launched a blitz of ads where he's basically trying to appear like this Joe Manchin type. And while I think once Vance, once the debates kind of happen, and once Vance actually gets his act together, which should be any any day now, because, you know, he's already starting to call out Tim Ryan's bullshit on Twitter and stuff. So we should 
be getting his campaign together for a little bit, but I think Tim Ryan is going to make some inroads with working class voters, and he might do decently with some suburbanites, but really, I think just the national environment with J.D. Vance also being a very populist Republican, I see no reason Tim Ryan's going to win. No way he's going to win this race. So of North Carolina, Ted Budd is the a congressman. He's great on the issues. He is endorsed by Trump. He's running in North Carolina, which is a very pro-Trump state. I mean, it's, it's a competitive state, but it is a pro-Trump state. It voted for Trump both times. Um, it tends to lean Republican on the national level. It's certainly not a safe Republican state, but definitely leans towards the GOP on most uh, in most elections. Um, Ted Budd is running as a solid Republican. He's leading in most of the polls. He's going to against Sherry Beasley, who is the Democrat, and she is a she was a member of the North Carolina Supreme Court, which isn't exactly a very well known position. Meanwhile, Ted Budd is a congressman who much of the state knows because Trump's done a lot of stuff with him. And Ted Budd is leading in the polls, and I think that Ted Budd should be able to win this race relatively handily. Um. The likely stage for the Democrats, I think, really is just the state of Colorado, and that's really only because the Democrat, the Republicans don't have a good candidate. Colorado used to be a relatively swing state or a Republican-leaning state. It has since shifted heavily away from the GOP. It voted for Biden by, like, 13 points or so in 2020. Well, it only voted for Hillary back in 2016 by, like, three or four. So... Colorado's an interesting state, trending heavily away from the GOP, mostly because of the millennials in the suburbs. But really, I think it could, the Republicans could have a chance to win it possibly this cycle. They're in a really good environment. The GOP certainly does have a chance at Colorado. And I, I, for a while, I thought they did. But unfortunately, the two reasons I think the GOP won't have a chance this cycle, and probably not for a while, this is this, this was going to be the last chance the Republicans had at winning in Colorado. And I don't think they're going to win it to, um, this cycle because, A, the governor, Jared Polis, is super popular. This guy is beloved in Colorado, and he is basically reinvigorating the Democrats there. He's going to boost a millennial and liberal turnout there, and he's going to do, and he's going to carry whatever Democratic senator manages to uh, come across. He's going to carry any the Democrat nominee for Senate. So Jared Polis is probably going to win by a safe margin just because of how popular he is, and he would help that uh, he would help other Democrats down ballot do well, do very well. And the only Republican set nominee for Senate who had a chance at winning is actually actually lost the nomination process. Colorado, the weird the way they do primary stuff, the actual like party uh, establishment votes on it, it's weird. But long story short, the only Republican who had a chance and who was leading in the polls to possibly make it interesting lost the nomination to this other guy. And um, against a, a, a Republican who has very little name recognition, against a Democrat who is going to be carried along and being cam and cam being campaigning with a very popular governor, I don't think it's going to happen. I think the I think the uh, I think the Republicans lose there by about six to seven points. It'll still be relatively close, but not really. Uh, that brings us to the lean states. The lean states for the GOP include the states of Nevada, Arizona, um, George, and Georgia. Um, that's going to be it. Um, the state of Nevada, um, Adam Lacks, all the Republican nominee there, he'll be, he'll, he's going to be Catherine Cortez Masto. Catherine Cortez Masto used to be kind of this, like, she wasn't a moderate, but she was, you know, at least, she, she was center-left. She was always a liberal, but she wasn't super left-leaning. But since, uh, since that, she realizes that she's probably going to lose to Adam Lacks, all, she's gone full in, all, all she's basically done the last few months is basically, uh, complain about abortion on Twitter. And she's barely been campaigning. The Republican Party absolutely smoked the Democrats in turnout in the primary last week. Um, like the Republicans had like a hundred thousand, fifty to a hundred thousand more voters than the Democrats did. And while that's not the that's not that that's not the best method of determining who's going to win, it is it it gives you a sense of how excited and how much energy each side has. And the fact, the fact that Democrats could barely get lost that badly to the Republicans in a state that Biden won by two percentage points really shows how far the state the state has shifted to the right. As well as the fact that the DSA is going to probably make prop Catholic and Cortez Masto up as this like progressive type, which isn't going to bode well either. Adam Laxalt's leading in the polls. Adam Laxalt's running a good campaign, and I think he should have no problem winning. He'll run by two to three points. Instead of Arizona, Blake Masters is officially endorsed by Donald Trump. He is my favorite candidate running this cycle. He's very anti-immigration, which will do well in a state like Arizona. A lot of suburbanites were probably initially turned off by Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric, but I think now that we've seen the invasion of our southern border happening, I think that a lot of them are probably going to come around to that. And just the national environment of Blake Masters running a, de a decent campaign, he points out that Mark Kelly is not the moderate he said he was, and Mark Kelly votes with Biden pretty much 100% of the time. You know, he talks about how Kirsten Cinema has is, and is, is an actual moderate because you know she bucks party line mark kelly never does that if he just runs a half decent campaign and he attacks mark kelly properly which can be done mark kelly is a very vulnerable incumbent he only won because martha mcsally the republican nominee back in 2020 was horrible she just she did an awful job campaigning she should have won that race um and so yeah blake master just if he just runs a decent campaign he he emphasizes um his populism 
uh, you know, really he should have no problem defeating Mark Kelly. The state of Georgia, Herschel Walker has had a lot of scandals come out the last few weeks. There was the whole thing a few weeks ago about how apparently he was upset that Trump was kind of like, uh, I don't know, Tr Trump basically said in an interview that he got Herschel Walker to run for Senate. Well, Herschel Walker was like, I did this myself. Trump did not make me do anything. So he, that kind of got him in the news. And then now recently it's just come out that he apparently has, he fathered a, sons. Like he had an affair and he has two more sons than uh, he thought he did. I'm not sure exactly what happened there. I think it's still a developing story. But if that is true, that is really going to hurt him. But then again, his opponent Raphael Warnock is just as, just as, just as awful. <laughs> I mean, that stuff that that stuff's horrible. If, if, that, if it's true, I'm not 100 percent sure if it's true or not. Because you know, you know, you can't trust anything you hear nowadays. We heard that there was a whole story about how Lauren Boebert, the congressman from Colorado, apparently we used to be a prostitute who has had several abortions. Everyone painted that as, oh, look how true this is, when actually it's not true. And it just, it really hurt her credibility, and so I'm not I'm really not sure if this is just an attack from the left. That's not true, or if it is true. If it is true, then Herschel Walker has a that's we have a problem in Georgia. Herschel Walker might be screwed, but if it's not true, who cares? He's still gonna win. Um, but Raphael Warnock also has skeletons in his closet. Uh, there's allegations of him abusing his wife and his kids. This guy Raphael Warnock is a horrible person. So honestly, I, I think any allegation that that may be true about Herschel Walker can probably just be the same can be said for Raphael Warnock. So yeah, I think that this is race is going to be one of those races where you know neither candidate is all that likable, but Herschel Walker a has a, probably a better personality from what we've seen. I mean he's a he's a chill guy, even if the allegations are true. He's relatively charismatic. I mean he's not he's not like Trump, but you know he he he, he can he can wheel his he wheel his way out of it. Raphael Warnock not so much, and Raphael Warnock has voted like he's in like like he's in New York. Raphael Warnock represents a relatively socially conservative southern state. Not like a liberal northeastern state. Well, Raphael Warnock is basically on full-on left-leaning on like abortion and gay rights. When he's apparently he's supposed to be this like moderate conservative black pastor, he's literally tweeted as a black as a pro-choice pastor. You can't be a pro-choice pastor. Georgia, despite the massive growth Atlanta has seen, even in a lot of the black areas in rural Georgia, is still a very socially conservative area. People don't realize that most African Americans in the South are still very socially conservative. They're still very Baptist, and so. I think Raphael Warnock is kind of shooting himself in the foot. With suburbanites less likely to turn out because they don't like Biden, and with the rural area still very energized because of Herschel Walker's pro football career and him just being endorsed by Trump in the national environment, I think uh, Herschel Walker should still win this race by two to three points. And for a while, I had uh, Herschel Walker winning by four to five points. I think because of the scandals, it's going to be more like two to three. But Herschel Walker should still win the state relatively handily. Um, instead, Pennsylvania is going to tilt the GOP as well as they have New Hampshire. Um... Actually, we're going to film instead of Washington. That's going to lean to the Democrats. Um, we'll talk about Washington first. Washington, um, incumbent Democrat, um, Patty Murray. She's been in the Senate for a very long time. She's not super popular in the state. She's just kind of like your generic Democrat. And she actually has a shot at losing. Um, Tiffany Smiley, she is the wife of a wounded combat veteran who fought at the VA in, in, for benefits. She worked with Trump in Washington, D.C. To, kind of to kind of fix the VA and make it just work better for veterans. Because a lot of people, you know, a lot of people don't like the VA because, you know, it's, it's, it sucks. It's not a good organization. It screws over veterans a lot. It's, it's very bureaucratic. And Tiffany Smiley, her husband was wounded in, I believe, Iraq. And he was got screwed over by the VA with his benef health benefits. And so she literally went to Washington, D.C. in the early Early 2000s, she fought against the VA, got him his compensation, and then she worked with Trump to fix the VA even more. And she is very well known among veterans and their families. And she is running for Senate instead of Washington. Um, and she's actually running a very good campaign. I'm going to make another video about her campaign because this is honestly a sleeper flip. She has made the polls much more much more competitive than they need to be. A progressive Democrat internal. See, these are these are like AOC types, Bernie bro types who are very liberal leaning, and they're a pollster. They have this race within 10 points. You take. I'd like to take in Democrat internals. Add about three points or so to the uh, other side. So you take ten points. Add three. That means if, that means Patty Murray is only up by seven points. Factor in the national environment. The national environment looks to be about R plus six, R plus seven. We have a dead heat instead of Washington. Now we're still a very long way out. Tiffany Smiley. Um, obviously her campaign is very grassroots, but still Patty Murray is really hasn't even sort of been campaigning yet. She's already beginning to launch attack ads. But really, this race, this race could get interesting. I have it lean Democrat as of now. I would not be surprised if if Tiffany Smiley manages to pull off a victory here. Um, but at the same time, Patty Murray is a relatively. She's not super popular. She's not very popular in coming, but she has been there a very long time. 
there's been some iffy stuff with the Democrats in Washington. You know, there's some. There are a couple of races in the early 2000s that were super competitive that we now know that some iffy stuff might have happened with the Democrats possibly um, borrowing the elections from the Republicans in the Senate and governor races. So, you know, Washington, people don't people talk about when you talk about like corrupt states, you think of like Illinois or New York or like maybe even Texas and southern states. But instead of Washington itself is actually it has a history of some some shady stuff going on with its elections. So that's something we're going to have to keep our eyes on. But Tiffany Smiley, yeah, she's running a relatively uh, populist campaign. She wants benefits for farmers, benefits for veteran, veterans. She wants to hold the federal government accountable. Um, she's running on a very pro-family campaign, which is interesting to see. You don't see a lot of Republicans running on that. So it's interesting to see how that might work out in, say, like, in, a, in a relatively um, progressive state like Washington. Um, on social issues, she's not great, but she's still a socially conservative. I believe she's pro-life. Um, she's, you know, she's, a, she's a generic Republican on social issues, but on economics, she's actually relatively populist, relatively America first, which is interesting because, you know, we talk about America first candidates. We see, well, how, how will they do in, like, Republican states? But we don't, we don't talk about how well uh, America first candidates may do in, like, liberal states. Like, Washington is a very progressive state. They're in, they're, they support Bernie Sanders. They, they're very liberal and progressive on economics. What would happen if we put a Republican who is socially conservative, so they'll still do well in rural areas and get the generic Republicans to turn out, but they're also economically populist. Would Democrats switch over and support them? We saw that in 2016 with Bernie Sanders. People don't talk about it in states like Iowa uh, and some Rust Belt states that a lot of Bernie Sanders voters in the Democratic primary voted for Donald Trump in the general again over Hillary Clinton. I'm not saying that's going to happen in Washington, but it is just interesting to think about that. You know, if you're a progr if you're a, a lot of people who like Bernie Sanders in economics, they're not super left leaning on social issues. And so in a national environment that favors the GOP, Biden's not very popular. If you get a Republican who, you know, is honestly relatively populist in economics, relatively decent on the issues and isn't like a total and is a young, um, accomplished person who's populist in economics, could those suburbanites who maybe voted for Bernie Sanders and are progressive switch over and vote Republican? I'm interested to see, I'm going to keep my eye on this race personally. I'm very interested to see if that happens because if it does, it proves that populist economics are the future for the Republican Party. If it doesn't happen, then, you know, kind of just proves my whole narrative I'm running on right now. But Washington, even if Tiffany Smiley does not win, if she still does decently with suburbanites and stuff, that could be a huge uh, turning. That could just be a huge showdown for what the future of the Republican Party may be. Went on a tangent there, I apologize. It says that Pennsylvania and New Hampshire are both, as of now, going to tilt to the Republican Party. Instead of Pennsylvania, Dr. Oz is the Republican nominee. He very narrowly defeated um, David McCormick in the Republican primary, and thank God he did. David McCormick is awful. This is literally going to be, this, he's literally going to be a Mitt Romney 2.0 if he were to get elected. But uh, Dr. Oz is going to be a generic Republican in the state of Pennsylvania. He's not going to be a rhino. Um, he actually taught, a lot of people say, but he, he has a uh, Turkish citizenship. Um, he's he's going to be, he, he lives in Turkey. His backstory about why he has Turkish citizenship, he's been very open about this, and props to him. Dr. Oz has a dual citizenship in the United States and Turkey. He has citizenship in Turkey because his his sister is, like, I think mentally insane or something. I'm not sure exactly. But his sister, who lives in, Tur who lives in Turkey, is, like, uh, a crazy person. And his mom, who also lives in Turkey, has Alzheimer's. If Dr. Oz were to give up his Turkish citizenship, his sister, who has a history of mental illness and who has very iffy relationship with his family, would be the parental guardian of his mom, who is sick with Alzheimer's. So Dr. Oz only keeps that only keeps that citizenship because if he didn't, his sister, who he is who his who does not like his family, who he has a very rocky relationship with, and who has some has some issues with mental health, would be the caretaker legally of his mom in Turkey. And so honestly, and he's been very open about this, this is all true, he's talked about this several times, and really that proves any, any narrative you can have about Dr. Oz, I think that just proves that. He does, it's not like he wants to be a circus citizen, he literally has to, because if he doesn't, his sister, who is a mental illness, and who is a, who does not have a good relationship with his mom, would be her official caretaker, and his mom is sick with Alzheimer's. Dr. Oz makes frequent trips to Turkey to take care of his mom. And he has said, that despite all this, that if he were to win, he would be willing to give up his citizenship in Turkey because to serve in the U.S. Senate if it really is that big of an issue to voters. This proves any narrative you can think about Dr. Oz. I don't care what you say about Dr. Oz. Oh, he's a rhino. He lives in New Jersey. If you can't, if from, that, from that story, you can't see that he's a decent, hardworking guy. I'm sorry, but I... I have no respect for you. This is Dr. Oz. He is. He may have an iffy past and issues with like abortion and gun control. But if you actually look deeper into that, a lot of that was just his staff, the people around him. When you get to such a high position, you cannot be an open conservative. 
I mean, he's been friends with Trump for a long time, and Trump was not a, Trump was not a conservative by any stretch of the imagination either. So if you have an issue with uh, Dr. Oz having a liberal past, I would look in the mirror and look at Donald Trump, because Trump also has the same issues going on. And I would argue that Dr. Oz is probably a more pro-family, um, pro, um, pro-family candidate than Trump is. I mean, Dr. Oz has had one wife. He's had, you know, he's been relatively consistent, at least personally, with his social views. Trump not so much. Trump has said, what, three wives? He's had done stuff with prostitutes. So if you think that Oz is a social liberal, look at Trump, honestly. If you cannot, that's, so that's my rant about Dr. Oz. Um, I think he's only going to win very narrowly because, unfortunately, people are stupid and think that Dr. Oz is not a good, he is a rhino. And, um, the only, and really, um, Dr. Oz is against John Fetterman, who is a, who is a basically Bernie Sanders in the, uh, in the persona of this, like, construction worker conservative type. It's really weird. John Fetterman, the Democratic nominee for Senate in Pennsylvania, he's basically has the policies of Bernie Sanders, but he portrays himself, excuse me, he portrays himself as this like blue collar manufacturer type. So as this moderate. So I think once the scandals kind of come out uh, about not scandals, but him just being a, a, a socialist, once that comes out, that's going to get a lot of suburbanites on the fence about Dr. Oz to support him. A lot of working class voters as well. And Dr. Oz actually in the primary did very well with blue collar voters in like Southern and like near the West Virginia border and up here near New Jersey. He did very well with those voters already. And I think well, if he campaigned with Mastriano, the good candidate for governor, I think Dr. Oz should have no issues winning in Pennsylvania. It'll be close. Excuse me, Jesus. It'll be close, but I think that Dr. Oz should still win. So in New Hampshire, that's going to tilt to the GOP as well. Uh, Maggie Hassan's a very popular incumbent, and it really, it just depends on how big the national environment is. There are two two main Republicans running. We have Don Bolduc and Chuck Moore. Um, Chuck Moore is probably the more electable, um, but he's not as he's more libertarian. Well, Don Bolduc is not as electable, but he is more populist. I don't really have a preference between the two. It looks like Don Bolduc's going to be the nominee based on the polls we've seen. But really, either one of them, it sh have Chuck Moore has a better chance at beating Maggie Hassan, but they both, but it's not by much. Both of them are going to be solid c senators if they win. But both of them really are going to get carried by the national environment because Maggie Hassan, New Hampshire is going to be a very competitive state. Maggie Hassan is a relatively popular Democrat. Um, and so, yeah, New Hampshire is going to be a firefight. Really, just it's going to be between a few, uh, decide between a few thousand votes. Like most elections in New Hampshire have been decided by recently. New Hampshire has always been a very, always, at least recently, been a very competitive state. So with that, this is the 2022 Senate prediction. The Republican Party is at 54 Senate seats. The Democratic Party is 46. Uh, thank you for watching this video. And if you did, please be sure to like and subscribe for more.